Let's talk about the architecture in the first Halo Combat Evolved. I did a playthrough, and it left me asking a few questions. How did the pacing of the spaces of the environment affect your strategy as you played through? How did assuming the personality of Master Chief change the way that you perceived space? And to that end, what is the meaning or message behind the architecture of the Halo itself? This is not a strategy or a walkthrough or a history, but a discussion about what architectural thinking can tell us about video games and vice versa. Hi, I'm Scav, and I'm an architecture critic, and welcome to The Extra Office, where I play through video games and we do a little discussion about the architectural thinking that's going on. Let's get started. Halo Combat Evolved is a first-person shooter launched in 2001 on Xbox. It was developed by Bungie and published by Microsoft Game Studios. Now, this was the first game in a franchise which has sold more than 65 million copies worldwide. And just as a reminder, this video is only covering the first game of this series. While we are here to talk about the architecture, we perceive the architecture through the perspective eyes of our character. So an understanding of this character is crucial to understanding how the architecture changes our behavior as a player, especially through such a narrative first-person campaign. So we play through the campaign, of course, as Master Chief. Hailed as this mysterious hero, our identity is secret. But was Master Chief's identity really that secret? Because it was pretty clear to me as a young white man when I played this game that Master Master Chief was made for me. Master Chief loves action and not talk. We love to get things done. We shoot our way out of problems. But Master Chief doesn't really do it to stand up for anything in particular. There's no grave injustice we're fighting, really. It's a war. And there's no really moral dilemma either, but an enemy. So this sense of purpose never really develops into anything more than a series of sort of they hit us first so we have to hit them back kind of mentality. Now the narrative starts to cover up some of our recklessness. For example, the Flood escaping is seen as a failure of the Covenant to collect them or to control them, rather than on our end to actually just not bother opening up this ancient weapon. Master Chief was originally named the Cyborg, which is funny and I think would have made the game less commercially successful, but maybe a more rewarding experience. For me, playing in 2020, the marininess of the main character is just so played up. There's a beach landing, a deep forest green color, gasoline-based aesthetic experience of the Warthog, the overtly sexualized Cortana, and the ridiculous way that Marines are speaking in the 26th century. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! Mm -hmm. Damn right I am. And it isn't a fault of Bungie that the game didn't age well, but it is perhaps a symptom we can now read more overtly in the game industry. And, and the reason I say this is because if my memory serves me correctly, Master Chief was hailed as a kind of a neutral hero, right? Call of Duty was where you were obviously a marine killing people, but we... Master Chief was a, a, an unknown, mysterious soldier killing aliens for the survival of our species, right? But guess again, if it was popular in the 2000s, it was probably catering to a hegemonic audience of young white men that had just watched the Twin Towers fall. I gotta take the opportunity to go in a little further with this one. Check out the way Master Chief speaks to and threatens the Artificial Intelligence 343 Guilty Spark. You can feel the undercurrent of the Murica culture forming before your very eyes. 343 Guilty Spark decides that in order to stop the Flood, all sentient organic life should be wiped out. Which is a great plot twist for a sci-fi book, but not a great test of our character. Let me play the scene real quick. Enough! The flood is spreading. If we activate Halo's defenses, we can wipe them out. You have no idea how this ring works, do you? Why the Forerunners built it? Halo doesn't kill flood. It kills their food. Humans, Covenant, whatever. We're all equally edible. The only way to stop the flood is to starve them to death. And that's exactly what Halo is designed to do. Wipe the galaxy clean of all sentient life. Is it true? More or less. Technically, this installation's pulse has a maximum effective radius of 25,000 light years. But once the others follow suit, 
this galaxy will be quite devoid of life. Or at least any life with sufficient biomass to sustain the flood. But you already knew that. I mean, how could not you? So instead of reasoning with the AI for, I don't know, the survival of sentient life, Master Chief just starts shooting it and, um, and eventually blows up the entire Halo installation. What is actually insane about this scene is that it reframes the human behavior of Master Chief as acting more like a computer than the AI in the story. Cortana and Guilty Spark are surprised to find that they, not the human, are the only beings who have the capacity to reason and and think critically. This means that Master Chief is the computer. He is following orders like they are commands and enacting tactics like running programs in order to achieve an overall goal set by the AI. I mean, in this first episode of Halo, Master Chief might as well have had a thin blue line Punisher t-shirt on underneath that power armor. But Halo's campaign is so immersive that we as players might not have the time to consider our character's actions and what that means for what, what we're being fed. Now this revealing character behavior changes how we consider the architectural effect of the Halo itself. Because when we play a video game, we aren't observing the architecture from our own subjective taste, but from the taste of the subject that we are pretending to be. So aside from ourself being projected as Master Chief, let's look at a few other ways that we are conditioned spatially. One is of course the music. From the slow and churning churchy chorus to the quickening pace of drums and electric guitar solos, the sounds act a little less like entertainment and a lot more like the music in cinema, telling you how to feel. Now the chorus is reflective and it gives us room to pause and consider the depths of what we found. It's a effect really that's very churchy, uh, which is a great example of how video games tend to take spatial effects from something like a religious institution, but remove any of the meaning and symbolism and just represent them as things that induce reflective behavior. In other words, you might not be religious in real life, but in the game, the cultural knowledge surrounding those sounds are enough to let you delight in the seriousness of the endeavor. Now the other way we are conditioned is the font and menu system, which kind of pause and play the story as a movie, but in this example, the font and menus uh, look just like the kind of stuff we are experiencing in the game. They don't remove us from the story, they keep us locked in. Now, as hard as I was on the portrayal of Master Chief, a, a portrayal which is improved over time by Bungie, the spaces of Halo achieve something masterful and profound. You see, through the campaign, I found myself interacting with two different types of spaces, spaces of order and spaces of disarray. Now, while you're playing, only a couple of rooms and small bits will have a sense of organization or structure, which give way to these open fields or long, confusing tunnels or systems. But so the levels have a wonderful tone to them spatially. They form a kind of attack and release pattern on your spatial awareness, which reflects the overall pacing of the scenario itself. Now the difference between these two types of spaces can best be understood by what it felt like to pause in either space or to stop for a second. Now, when you take a moment of pause inside a room with rows of columns, familiar equipment, windows scaled to Master Chief size, it'll feel safe, protected, and secure. It is a space meant for us, and so we recharge and gather supplies. But a moment of pause in these chaotic spaces, typically on outside in the Halo installation, feels reflective and pensive and decidedly sublime because you're kind of turned around, but the only thing that orients you is the amazing view of the rest of the Halo. So you feel like you are fighting something bigger than yourself. These are two extremely successful spatial effects and you see them constantly come up throughout the rest of the series and still going really strong today. So let's talk about these spatial effects in general. Uh, the feeling of chaos or a chaotic space is a feeling of being completely turned around and lost with no understanding or direction. This can be great feeling if you are like on vacation wandering the streets of Paris or obviously a very scary feeling if you're in a firefight. 
These moments of chaos or being turned around also happen when I'm searching for the way forward. And the way forward was kind of intentionally hidden by Bungie, which afforded you, the player, more time to get to know your environment or have to explore it. And the forcing you to explore it and literally walk the halls is actually a way of making these spaces more meaningful to you. Now in architecture, we talk about these moments of pause and reflection as the sublime. Now the sublime is an aesthetic category describing the beauty of something that is great in size, power, morality, intellectually, or simply something with a scale that you can't comprehend. When we have some time to be alone in Halo, we look skyward and follow the end of the Halo all the way around. I think there's a whole video about the sublime and video games in general in my future. So how does the architecture influence our strategy? Well, like many other shooters, what weapon you have greatly affects your ability to threaten the space around you. But in Halo specifically, the organic and open spaces of many levels allowed for a player to adapt the game to their own play style. If you wanted to sit back and headshot with the pistol or run in there with the shotgun or even try guerrilla beatdown tactics. And I think this freedom created a unique experience for the player and great replay abilities. And it is really the space of the level that affords that. When you're in claustrophobic conditions, it's actually the space of the game that's telling you what weapon is best. When the spaces shrink, there's a smaller selection of weapons that work in those conditions. So the moment we've been waiting for, what is the significance of the Halo and how might we, the player, internalize Master Chief's struggle and carry it into our daily life? Let's look at the Halo itself. It is a circle, a symbol of uniformity, perfection, and utopia. And the actual Halo is borrowed from science fiction novels like Ringworld, but we find the circle more generally in canonical works of architecture throughout history, like the Circle Mound in Newark, Ohio, or the circular Oculus in the Pantheon. The circle as a function of human endeavor of, to represent perfection is undeniable. So we have examples of ring worlds and halos from speculative architects who were interested in creating possible scenarios and outcomes during the Cold War that were positive and exciting and hopeful. This leads us to a kind of scary conclusion that playing Halo through the eyes of a young white American man via Master Chief is the hidden drama of a right-wing libertarian fear. The libertarian right is a politics of extreme individualism, which is fueled by ego. The ego is high for those who are privileged and want to give themselves credit for all their own success rather than believe the overwhelming data which suggests that their success in life can be easily guessed based on their parents' income or what zip code they grew up in. Instead of using reason and critical theory to face their own ego and accept their lives as the result of privilege, libertarian right young white American men see calls for equitable living with others as attempts from beta males to stymie their unmistakable individual might. You may find somebody who, can, who refuses to confront their own privilege when they're wearing a thin blue line Punisher t-shirt, and so the equitable future of humanity might be kind of scary to them. Needless to say, in Halo, we are the hero when we destroy that piece of architecture. And in doing so, through actions instead of words, I think we're making the case for uh, the beautiful imperfection and flawed existence of sentient life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe to get more videos like this. Comment down below what game you think I should do next. Come find me on Patreon to join the Discord chat and add your voice to this discussion.